holy shit, it's Jerry McGrath. Oh shit, I gotta go again. Oh shit, I gotta put my shoulder in. <laughs> and then it just kept repeating. It was uh, the staple standards going nuts. It was pretty wild. And then, yeah, then Carmichael and Kevin Windham came into play. And, you know, just going against Pastrana and, you know, Metzger and Deegan and Twitch and like all the guys you like look up to, you know, all of a sudden you're, you're in there against the guys that you idolize. So it got pretty heavy. It got pretty intense. But, you know, like, like dad taught me, you know, just put your head down and, and go ride your dirt bike, you know? Welcome back for an all new episode of the Riders Lounge podcast. I'm your host for this series where we catch up with some interesting people in the world of motocross and action sports. And there's going to be a lot more variety in this series in the new year and there's already some big names already lined up so I can't wait to release those interviews very very soon. Now I've been out of action for a few weeks you've probably noticed but we were just getting the first season of the eSport with Night of the Jumps and TIMX. This is Motocross. We were just wrapping that up. And actually, my next guest was involved in the final episode where we crowned Matej Cezak from the Czech Republic as the champion where he took home real cash for playing a video game. But also he won an invite to compete at Night of the Jumps at the World Championships or the new Freeride MX World Tour in 2021. If you haven't played it yet, download it from the iOS or Android app stores. Now, before we get into this awesome interview with one of the biggest names in freestyle motocross and step up, I wanted to let you know if you're going into dry January, which you're probably already halfway through now anyway, but it's the perfect time to try something new. If you might have gone a little bit too big over the holiday season and you're trying to get fit or mentally back into working, which, well, it's a killer. I was thinking about the fact that we're supported by Roadhouse here with their alcohol-free range of beers in the Tannen Zepplers. So why not give it a crack? I'm already doing it and I'm feeling so much better for it already. Actually, I have a brand new website up as well for Writer's Lounge Podcast. While you're listening right now, you can go and check it out. It's simple, www.writersloungepodcast.com, created by my good friends, Lakes Networking. But I've also got a new sponsor on board from Spect Eyewear, and they're going to give out a few pairs of free sunglasses. So jump on the new website, first blog post. You'll find everything there that you need to win some sunglasses and actually after the last episode or the second last episode with Levi Sherwood I had so many messages about his next gen ramp to get the ramp plans and actually I'll put the ramp plans up on the website Levi is pumped that uh, so many of you are into his design we've seen it work you can double flip the ramp you can front flip the ramp the same ramp I mean, that's pretty freaking awesome. Um, So jump onto writersloungepodcast.com for Levi's ramp plans and also a new t-shirt with the ramp on there. I I love it. I think it looks pretty damn good. Anyway, so I was really stoked to have this new guest on the podcast this time and I met him uh, a few years ago. He's got more X Games medals than Wikipedia even gives him credit for, and that's a whole bunch. He's an all-around nice dude, legend of the sport, Matt Byton. Now, we met each other in Germany, actually, of all places, uh, when he was writing for Team USA at the Freestyle of Nations. We, uh, We got pretty awesome on some German beers, and I became an even bigger fan of him back then. Fast forward to now, and he was actually a judge on this first season, of the EFMX World Championship Series. And it was just so good to see him, you know, really, you know, saying exactly who he thought won that series of real freestyle riders playing a video game. Anyway, as we got into the interview, this is where my apologies are going to start for this episode. And I'm terribly sorry, but we had so many technical problems. I think maybe my internet was infected with the coronavirus. I think my laptop was It took us about three hours on the first interview. Unbelievable interview, but you will never hear it because my internet dropped out about five or six times and lost pretty much everything. So being the legend that Matt Byton is, 
he jumped back on for another call and we did it all again. And then that's where the second technological problem came through and my USB port for the microphone, I don't know, failed a spark plug, did a bottom end. I don't know what happened, but it was so distorted. I had Martin Zollner actually from da Dead Sailor Extreme, who's our video producer at Night of the Jumps. He listened to it. He tried to fix it. Took me a few days in the end. Uh, well, I think we've created enough magic that uh, we'll be able to stumble through this episode right now and you hopefully shouldn't be able to tell too badly my audio on my end matt byton's audio fantastic great and he's the guy you're here to listen to not me so without further ado i'm going to stop talking and enjoy this new episode with matt byton <laughs> So what's happening now, mate? You've moved down to Texas. You've got a new house. How's it working out? Yeah, moving down to Texas was a good move. They got a ton of motocross tracks, uh, way more than Southern California. And so, uh, yeah, I, I loved it out there. Missed some people and uh, a couple of the tracks. But, man, I, I knew there was big motocross scene in Texas. But, wow, it's it's pretty awesome. So found a bunch of tracks and a bunch of new friends to ride with and everything. So, uh it's uh texas is great you know i mean i picked up bass fishing and the new house is awesome sold my house in nevada and upgraded us here in texas and renting out the other house that we had bought here in texas so trying to get invested into a little bit of real estate uh the next is kind of my next 20 year plan so um hopefully that'll go good and then i can sell a couple of houses off and go golfing around the world that would be absolutely ideal now, why did you actually move down there when you had such a good group of guys in Nevada? Yeah, I moved to Southern California first in 2012, and those guys had moved away. Um, I mean, Miller had moved to Texas, and then Mason had moved to Las Vegas, and uh, Bubs had Brian Foster. He had moved down to Southern California and was working on the Deft Glove uh, program with Nate Adams and those guys. So, uh, kind of the like I was kind of a little bit bored, you know, um, Derek Berlue had moved back to New Jersey and, um, I mean, Adam Jones was there and, and we would ride, uh, but this kind of like, you know, uh, Kenny Bell had moved to Southern California too. And then I, I kind of trailed right after him. I just kind of wanted a change and there wasn't much snow. Like it'd be, it'd be cold and the, the winters would stuck, suck. So I couldn't go snowboarding. And then the dirt was dry. So I was like, screw this. And then every time I kept going to California, I just, I didn't want to go back home. So I was like, well, listen to yourself. So I moved down there for a little while and had a bunch of fun. It was awesome. Meeting up with the wild man, Mr. Jimmy Fitzpatrick. <laughs> He's a good guy. Uh, me and him have uh, burned some stuff down. It was awesome. And then uh, a lot of people have met him. So they know how he is. He's a good time. But uh, yeah, no, Southern California was awesome. Met some new friends there and stuff, Ricky Yorks and uh, my buddy Colin Yost. So um, had a lot of good friends there, enjoyed that. And uh, I wanted to invest into another house before I was trying to retire from riding, which isn't going so well. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, yeah, I ended up meeting Crystal and decided to pull the trigger and go ahead and move to Texas just to uh, kind of just think of my future. There's a lot of job opportunity out here in the Dallas Fort Worth area. So just trying to think more ahead, you know, I knew, didn't know exactly when I was going to retire, but I know it's closer than not. So I just want to start setting myself up by investing in another house and, uh, and, and all that. So, uh, you know, so far it's been a good decision. And if I could give any advice to any younger rider coming up, uh, try to set yourself up earlier. You know, I didn't, I didn't really plan on that. I was just more in the Montley crew mode, travel in my, travel and ride my dirt bike, which is magnificent, but definitely forgot a key factor there of uh, setting myself up a little bit better. I think I could have, could have done a better job of that. So that's a uh, one regret that I do have. Um, but other than that, it was awesome. And uh, yeah, there's definitely that balance, right? And I kind of set myself up before I got into freestyle, whereas it sounds like you're trying to, you know, backpedal a little bit now. Do you find that there is that balance between going hard, having a good time, but actually getting set up as well? Um, yeah, you know, like when freestyle started, it was like a punk rock way of life and just rowdy and, you know, um, just the craziness and fun of it. And, you know, that's what, uh, 
that's the way I took it in and that's the way I lived it. And I just wanted to carry on the tradition of the way that freestyle was made. Uh, maybe it wasn't the right decision, but I had a hell of a good time. So, <laughs> um, I don't regret it. I mean, you can't take, you can't take money to your grave and I've lived, I mean, I've done I've had a good time, uh, probably a little too much fun sometimes, but fuck it. You know what I mean? Like that's just, uh, that's Matt biting and that's, uh, you know, probably, uh, kind of, kind of hurt me with some sponsor stuff and, maybe uh in my freestyle abilities a little bit but you know what i i was just enjoying the moment and traveling the world and just meeting new people and just having fun and just you know i I tore it up and i don't regret it at all um now at a financial aspect now yes uh i probably could have did a little bit better but you know what fuck it i lived and had fun so no i don't you know what i mean yeah i'm hearing you basically don't let a moment go by yeah i took every moment in like I didn't let a moment slide by. Like I just, uh, you know, I just didn't let any moment slide by any opportunity of awesomeness. I could get my hands on I, I took advantage of it and I made sure I lifted it up, you know, especially kind of, you know, just, I was there when I like held Jim McNeil, like as he kind of his last like 30 minutes of warmth, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I went home and I rode, I had, I was like, I had to like, I had to crawl on the airplane. I was not in good shape. And then, uh, so that was like really tough. And then, so after that, that put it in like a bit more perspective of, you know, that I really need to not let any moments slide by, you know, I mean, so, I mean, it was, uh, wow. that was, that was like a huge eye opener, you know, I, not that I wasn't a punk rock crazy fuck before, but, uh, <laughs> it was, uh, um, you know, I kind of put it in more perspective that just to maybe like enjoy, each moment instead of just tearing shit up just kind of try to take a step back and enjoy it i guess that's what i'm trying to say so you know uh you know you just never know and uh so did you approach fmx differently after that no no i couldn't i didn't didn't let it uh didn't let it phase me you can't think of that we all know the risk um no i fuck i went home and uh i woke up the next morning and i was like i gotta go jump my fucking dirt bike so me and my kid loaded up. We went out to Miller's place because he had a riding compound up there at the time. And um, I went and hit the ramps and went ran through all my tricks. And just, uh, you know, uh, it, it's definitely tough to get on the bike, but you got to buck up and do it. You know what I mean? It's uh, this ain't a this ain't a, a powder puff sport. It's a man sport. And, uh, you know, you got to, uh, you know, we're we'll ride till we die for sure. And uh, you got to it's just the way it's just the nature of the beast, unfortunately. And you can't let it like, you know, it, it'll humble you for sure. When you see it that close, uh, in person, it's very, uh, it's very scary what we witnessed. It wasn't cool. Uh, it sucked. Like it was, uh, definitely, uh, hits home for sure because we rented, we flew, I flew to Phoenix, Jim got on the plane and we flew to Dallas. We rented a car together, you know, like mm-hmm. I know the last thing he ate was a ice cream sandwich and, uh, mm-hmm and had a Dr. Pepper. That's the last thing he had in his belly. Like I know that much detail. And like our hotel room was room number was one Oh one at a motel six from from Texas motor speedway. Like I know the detail details, but yeah, I mean, you gotta like, you gotta roll on. And I mean, you know what Jim would, I know what Jim would say. And we know what any one of us would say to the other riders, you know, you gotta, you gotta get back on that bike and ride, you know? So, I mean, I think we all have a weird brotherhood of an understanding of that. So yeah. you got to ride on, you can't let it phase you. And, uh, you just got to dig deep and ride for Jim, you know? So that's, uh, that's what we did. And that's how we carried it over here. And I'm sure people around the world that, that love Jim too, and did that same thing. So Jim was definitely awesome. And uh, a funny guy, we were jumping the rental car and I'll tell you what, he was laughing his ass off all the way up. Like we, it took us like a half hour to get geared up. Like we couldn't even, we were getting yelled at because we were laughing so hard before we geared up that morning. So, uh, he, he laughed all the way till the end and we were having fun. And, um, the rental car might've had a couple of flat spots in the tires from the e-brake and <laughs> we, we were launching that thing. We were, we, I, I had rented the car, right? I reserved it. And he's all, we go walk to like the rental car thing and you get to pick any car you want. And he's all, we're taking that one. And it's the little, when the Fiat came out, like I'm yeah. like, yeah, two OGO gear bags and backpacks. So that's not going to fit in the car. Like we're arguing. <laughs> and he's all bullshit. It's fitting. I'm like, no, it's not Jim. And he's all watch. And he starts shimmying seats and doing all that. And he starts 
elbow dropping gear bags and we get the bags in there and so we're crammed in there like two monkeys in a sardine can and uh <laughs> and we end up like just like jumping that uh rental car right away like we weren't even out of the airport and there's this like pretty good size speed bump and we aired that thing so <laughs> uh yeah no we were yeah definitely uh definitely a tough moment but yeah you got to ride on like jim would say yeah exactly man i'm hearing you did it actually hit you later on then like a week later a month later or a year later yeah no i mean it's uh just something you learn to live with you don't i mean you don't really have a choice uh it's just um it you know you can i'm pretty much speechless don't really got much to say it's just you just gotta ride and roll forward you know i mean it's uh unfortunately the way the cookie crumbled that day uh well, to be honest, I didn't even expect we would get into Jim McNeil. Um, I didn't know that story. Um, so thank you very much for sharing it. Um, but let's try and get to a, maybe a happier topic or a nicer topic. Um, how did you even get into motorbikes to kickstart all of this off? Yeah, so when I was like 10 years old, uh, the older kids in the neighborhood... Um, they were kind of they were getting into riding and like knew what supercross was and motocross racing and um next thing i know we were all having to um everybody uh would grab our we'd grab all of our uh <laughs> our hoses and you know we'd string them from uh our buddy donnie's house because he had the the uh, property behind him where it was good to build jumps so yeah we had uh, string all of our hoses out there, and if you didn't do it, you'd be hanging on your fence by your underwear till you went and uh, <laughs> went and got it. We kind of the, the tougher kids uh, broke us in for sure, made us tough. That the older kids, and uh, so, anyways, yeah, we had, we'd be pulling sagebrush, and everyone would grab their shovels and hoses and bikes, and then you know I just loved it so much jumping. I thought it was the coolest thing ever, and then got turned on to Supercross, you know, watching like Ricky Johnson and uh, David Bailey that's kind of when I started watching and, uh, yeah. you know, John Michelle bell and all that stuff. So yeah, I mean, uh, great, great years there. And then I was just hooked, you know, then Jeremy McGrath came along and, uh, it was just like in awe, like over the guy's talents. Uh, I think he, he got all of us, you know, McGrath's the man. Yeah. And so, yeah, just stuck with it. Just kept doing BMX, kept building more jumps and more jumps. The older kids kind of grew up and went away. And then, you know, we were getting, uh, I was able to get, you know, turn 16, get my license and then started uh, just kind of racing locally and stuff. And that's when uh, I, I, you know, I met Mason and Miller and, and Brian Foster and a bunch of the guys in like 90, 92, 93 and met them. And then uh, was just kind of, we just all hung out and we rode a bunch together and got a race when we can. And uh, those guys, I got them into BMX a bit. And so they were pumped on jumping and just started doing tricks um one of my buddies dustin paxton he did a knack knack like jeremy mcgrath style yeah and my bmx bike and i thought it was the coolest thing ever and he kind of told me how to do it and i tried it and i sure enough i did it and i was like well that was kind of easy and then that's when i kind of figured out that i could uh do some stuff you know so then i you know i started taking one hand off two hands doing no footed cans and stuff and then uh, then freestyle motocross came around in like 97 and, um, then I kind of started doing that on the, on the dirt bike and, uh, man, I, I like the idea of being able to jump more. I like the motocross bike more than, uh, than, than BMX. And then, so they were great to cross over to help each other, to help, help tune in the skills. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I, I mean, I had to hit like some pretty big BMX dirt jumps and stuff. So, um. I wasn't scared to send it. So then carried that over to, to the dirt bike and stuff. And I like the thought of less pedaling and you can jump farther. So that was pretty simple math there for me. So putting a little more time on the dirt bike when I could, but, uh, when I couldn't afford to race, uh, the dirt bikes, I would, um, race BMX bikes and whatnot. So just did what I can to get by. I would flag on like a weekend before or dig the starting gates out one weekend. And then oh, I would, okay. I, I, I'd pay for my entry the next weekend because old pops, he was a single dad trying to take care of two, two wild kids. So, um, parents didn't really put too much money into like wanting to race and stuff, which I understand, you know, pops was just trying to survive. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, you know, I had, uh, 
I had a lock on what I wanted to do. And yeah, I ended up like breaking my jaw and getting a plate and six screws, broke my hum- left humerus bone in two spots, broke my back. And then um, I was like pretty much done. I was going to quit. I was like 20 years old trying to get in the carpenters union. And <laughs> like, uh, so like I was like pretty down and out, called Mason. And he's like, dude, you can't sell your bike because I just started doing like a cliffhanger and some a couple tricks you know and that's when miller and drake started coming onto the scene at like gravity games and stuff in like 2001 and or so so yeah then uh, miller ended up loaning me fifteen hundred dollars and talked me into not selling my bike him and mason did so i kept my bike and i uh like I was kind of like on the fence you know I was trying to get on the two tours Mark Burnett had a tour warp yeah. tour I was trying to get on a warp tour or I was gonna go try to be a Navy seal or I was uh, gonna go do underwater welding in Central California go to a, a college over there to learn that and then uh, I got on Mark Burnett's tour I got an opportunity there in 2002 and Jesse Olson uh, I couldn't even afford to get on tour I had an 85 Ford Ranger that maybe it would make it across town. <laughs> wow. Uh, so Olson, uh, Jesse Olson, an old legendary guy himself, came over from Sacramento and picked me up. And we drove down to San Diego. It's like a 10 hour drive. And like, I couldn't even afford to get on tour. I had a hundred dollars to my name. My dad gave That's me 200 crazy. bucks. I had my clothes bag and my gear bag and my blown out 01 CR 250 and uh, made it on the tour and did step up all summer long. And just tried to make a little extra money, you know, I was, I was a broke kid. So I was doing whatever I could to make some money. And, uh, next thing I know, they had a X games qualifier in Reno in October of 2002. And they probably had like at least like 60 dudes there from all around the world. That was like every freestyle. Really? 60. That, yeah. That was like every freestyle guy, like in the world, you know, it was, uh, it might've not even been 60, but uh, <laughs> it's been a while, but around there. <laughs> But that's when we all knew of everyone, you know, like Edgar and, you know, everybody was there, Deegan and the whole militia and everyone except Pastrana. And uh, so. Isn't it crazy to think that even Deegan had to qualify to get into X Games? Yeah. Back then in 02, we all had to. Yeah. They had a they had three qualifiers, one in Reno, Bakersfield, and one in New York. So, yeah, we all had to do it. And if we wanted in, so. I actually remember seeing all of that on freestylemtx.com way, way back in the day when you had to wait on your 33.3 kilobyte per second modem and, uh, man, you had to wait like 10 minutes for the smallest image to come up. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, it's it's pretty cool. I mean, I guess we were spoiled here in the States and it's cool to think like, you know, guys like yourself were like so into it all around the world, you know? So, I mean, it's... It's cool to see the sport just grow, you know. I like seeing the new kids coming in and just seeing the sport, like, still going and um, kids just going out there and sending it. So I, I love to see that, man. It's it's cool to see how much it's grown. Like, Yeah, it's funny. Like, I was watching you way back then when the sport started, and that got me into freestyle motocross. But actually, you've got your own cool story basically along the same lines and there was a big event um before we forget about it tell us about that one. Oh yeah um in 99 when they had the x games in san francisco that was only four hours uh west of us from reno yeah. so yeah i mean you can take a uh, miller and uh, mason and and foster and i believe it was our buddy freddie and me we all jumped in a car and we pinned it down there to the bay area and so yeah we were in the stands there when or in the right like right up front like a couple rows back just standing there watching uh that 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 contest when pastrana launched his bike into the uh bay and stuff that was awesome i caught chris rourke's goggles his oakley's that's so, so crazy yeah i mean you, that's uh you never know who's gonna be in the stands man you can inspire anyone so uh you know it's a, it's pretty cool to think like that and you know next thing i know like we all were hungry. We wanted it right there. We were just kind of finishing up racing and uh, went on to there and went on to freestyle. You know, I mean, even uh, Mason, he uh, ended up blowing both of his knees out, like from doing arena cross racing. And he was down and out. I loaned him $1,500 <laughs> and uh, kind of helped get him going. So, you know, we like Miller loaned me $1,500 and got me out of the hole. And I loaned Mason $1,500 and, you know, 
1500 like that, but we laddered each other up with our talents and skills and pushed each other and got you know kept each other's mind in it and you know uh love the nevada boys that we definitely had a good time together traveling and having fun and going to all the events you know and vhc hey that's and where VHC. it's at yeah buddy um yeah seems like everyone's hung it up it's uh Berlue's still kind of going he, him and adam jones moved over from the east coast and joined us in nevada there so um yeah majority of the core nevada guys are are retired and somehow my old ass is still jumping <laughs> so you've watched the 1999 x games you've then got into your own x games event to ride how the hell did that feel yeah, the, the way I got into the first X Games is uh, back, we're tracking back to how they had the first qualifier in uh, Reno. Um, you had to qualify and to make the top 20 to make the night show. And uh, I did that. And then I got, you had to get top 10 to do big air or step up. And I got 11th. And then, so I was in my van and halfway geared down, had half a beer down me. And they came, X Games people came up to me and were, Hey, can you ride step up? And I was trying to be a good guy, even though I was a wild son of a bitch. Um, I was like, uh, I had a some half a beer. <laughs> They're like, can you ride them? Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> so I went out and uh, went and did step up because I guess Deegan backed out of step up. So uh, I ended up um, winning the damn thing. And that's what got me in the X Games. If you won any of the qualifiers, you're automatically in X Games. So that was pretty awesome and then uh yeah went to my first one and pastrana was in it and i was like oh shit and it was in the staples center and i was like nervous any of these these guys that listen to this that have been in the action for the first time they know that feeling it's like oh shit this is real <laughs> once you're in the staples center and it's you know it's all exciting and then you get down there and then it's an oh shit moment but yeah. uh, you know, I just, uh you know that's what i think carried me on uh, through all the years is to handle the pressure, you know, uh, one day I was at a race and my dad, like, I was like all intimidated. There was like a couple of like kids and they were like, you know, little factory Kawasaki kids and Suzuki. And I was like, I was all scared and telling my dad all nervous, intimidated. And my dad's like, screw them. They put on pants the same way you do go out there and kick their ass. So exactly. every- Ever since then, like I don't, I didn't let myself get intimidated by anyone, and I just buckled down, put my head down the road, and ended up winning that too. So in '03, so <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Like just get out there and do your own thing. But actually, I was thinking about X Games. I never rode it, but I was there in 2012 with Clinton Moore when he went for the 720, the TP role uh, in Best Trick. And it was that one where he got smacked in the back when his bike was revving out after he had that crash and the guy picked it up and it just hit him. Um, But yeah, it's just thinking about like being inside the Staples Center and that feeling like it's just, you know, you get goosebumps looking at it. Yeah, it's pretty gnarly. And then, then, yeah, in 2012, that's when Renner and I went up to 47 feet. Like I cleared 46.6 and then Renner got me and I hit out on 47 and Renner cleared 47 feet. So I don't know if anybody will ever beat that one. But Jerry McNeil goes pretty good. And Corey Creed. Yeah, those guys are going big now. But before we get into the secrets of Step Up, um, looking into the research actually for you and X Games, Looks like the research is a little bit wrong. Uh, You've actually got more medals than what Wikipedia is saying, right? Yeah, I got 12. Um, I don't really know how they count it. They had a Navy Moto World X Games, and that's when I I had won that one too with Renner and Carmichael in that. Um, I believe Clowers as well. Maybe Twitch was the other one. Mm -hmm. Um, And then that's when they they first started doing the... um, the world X games, they had one in Mexico city and Brazil X games and ended up uh, winning those ones too. And they said those didn't, didn't qualify as uh, X games medals, but it's an X games event. And then a couple of years later, they start doing more of the world X games. And then all of a sudden those people are X games, gold medalists. So I don't know why I'm not, but yeah, you take it. <laughs> uh, it's just something to chuckle about now. It's whatever. But um, so yeah, yeah technically 12 medals and then should probably have a few more because they were only giving out gold on uh 
on step up, but then on TV they would promote that you got a silver and a bronze, and that never made sense to me. I'm like, well, if you're only giving out gold, then only say you're giving out gold. Don't tell people on TV that you gave a silver and bronze, because then people ask us about it, and I'm like, no, I didn't get a medal. They're like, well, it said on TV. <laughs> so I ended up talking to Tim Reed and stuff, and uh, ended up getting the guys medals. I argued that for some years, and then getting. Uh, getting uh, silver and bronze medals for everyone. So technically I should probably have about three or four more, but they didn't give them out. And uh, I just heard that they stopped doing it again and that they're only giving out gold again. So that's a, uh, it's unfortunate that it's like that, you know I mean? In my opinion that they got the money and, you know, I mean, uh, I think they need to give medals out, you know, bronze and silver as well. Yeah, because I don't have a penny of any of that money anymore. <laughs> <You> do it, <laughs> but I got the medals on my wall that are like you know, just I mean, they don't mean anything to anyone, but they're they're cool for me. You know what I mean? Just yeah. you know, you, you take the risk and you'd like a little reward, and then you know, I mean, or you could just be like Dustin Miller. He'd go win a contest and they'd give his trophy away to the crowd. <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah. It's so crazy, actually. Yeah. Um, but looking at x games at your results there you have won the gold medal in step up in what 2003 2006 2010 and 2011 you've ridden against the biggest the best riders ever on a motocross bike ronnie renner tommy clowers ricky carmichael jeremy mcgrath man yeah i mean bottom line i mean i came up like any other kid like idolizing these guys and the next thing i know i'm i'm battling against them like 2004 was insane because they put mcgrath in there and then it, it came down to just him and i for the win and my shoulders dislocate and i put it back no. in, once in practice one and twice in the contest and man i had so much damn tape around my shoulder trying to keep the thing in and i would just land just flexing my arm like as hard as i could and the thing would still come out um and then, but, you know, so I'm like sitting there, I'm like, oh man, his bike is awesome. Like just checking out the, the home, his, his bike, you know, like, <laughs> and then I'm like, holy shit, it's Jerry McGrath. Oh shit. I got to go again. Oh shit. I got to put my shoulder in. <laughs> and then it just kept repeating. It was, uh, the staple standards going nuts. It was pretty wild. And then, yeah, then Carmichael and Kevin Windham came into play and, you know, just going against Pastrana and, you know, Metzger and Deegan and Twitch and like all the guys you like look up to, you know, all of a sudden you're you're in there against the guys that you idolize. So it got pretty heavy. It got pretty intense, but you know, like, like dad taught me, you know, just put your head down and, and go ride your dirt bike, you know? So that's what I did. That was my mindset always. And that's how I survived it. You know, I wouldn't like focus on any of the pressure. All I'd care about is clearing the bar. I wouldn't give a hell what cameras in front of my face or where I'm at. You can't think of none of that. I would just put my head down, focus and ride. And all I cared about was clearing the bar and getting a good start and you know that's where i just i didn't let uh let anything phase me you know you gotta you gotta stay uh stay focused and that's how i was able to get through all that so who then was like your toughest competitor in step up um yeah i mean obviously tommy clowers was strong in the the first few years and then uh renner and i we had uh you know quite the uh rivalry and uh renner was probably my number one nemesis and then i mean carmichael was untouchable i mean our bike sounded like PW fifties compared to his bike. Like his bike sounded so gnarly. I call it down in the hole. So like, that's kind of like right there at the, the step up lip, you know, you, you can't really hear it until you're like, you can't hear what everybody's got in their bike until you're like down there and it echoes off the lip, you know? Yeah. Uh, so like, I, that's why I call it always just down in the hole, you know, but, uh, so yeah, I mean, Carmichael's bike, the, just the grunt power that that thing, the roar that that thing had, that thing just was, I was like, holy shit, this guy's going to kill himself. Like he would go so high. Like we wouldn't even stand a chance in practice. I was like, oh shit. So yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of those guys were good, you know, I mean, um, and then at the end with like Jerry McNeil coming in, you know, he, he's obviously a, a strong, uh, competitor himself, uh. He weighs like maybe 15 pounds and on a 450, that thing is going to go. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was, a, a, it was cool to go through a lot of, uh, a lot of good, uh, fierce competition, you know, hats off to all those guys, a lot of respect to everyone. Cause I know how gnarly it is to get up there and over the bar. And then once you clear the bar, then there's a, Oh shit moment of, I got to land this thing. Like, 
I can't tell you how many black and white flashes I would have and just I would squeeze the bars as hard as I could. Really? Just waiting to hit the deck and I'd be like, oh, I didn't crash. That's awesome. <laughs> it would just be like a black and white flash like you just got like punched or something. And, um, and then your nuts are into next year. That would hurt. <laughs> And especially on the new new bike, you know, you got your bike all blinging for step up. You got a brand new gripper seat, and holy cow, uh, that would hurt. <laughs> the details, huh? Yeah. So they don't. So what would suck is like you would be trying to catch your breath because uh, it'd feel like someone booted you in the the twigs and berries, and then uh, you got to go like then you got to do it again, and then guys start getting knocked out, and your turnaround time to catch your breath isn't like as good, and then the bar's higher and you got to go again and your nuts still hurt. <laughs> like, ah. man, it, it got like, it got gnarly. Like I'll tell you what, 2012, that was the gnarliest one, like clearing 46, six. You can see my GoPro on uh YouTube, put in like Matt Biden step up 2012. And you can count like two and a half Mississippi before I land. You can tell like when I pop over the bar, like, so it was pretty gnarly for sure. Like, um, yes, I'm, I really don't, miss step up <laughs> <laughs> so you are actually in the top three in step up for 10 years yeah i made the top three and then once it moved to austin it just i just couldn't get it to click for me uh um, i'm not sure what what happened there uh probably because i was still on the carbureted bike i'd assume it's probably what a lot of people would assume as well um but i mean that thing was there um we just i don't know with the humidity and stuff and a carbureted bike and that the bike being the motor being so built it's so temperamental i don't think we got it to run right in my opinion even though it would sound good it just like it didn't have the grunt up the lip like that i that i was used to having with that bike yeah. so i don't know with uh the humidity i think kind of uh hurt the carburetor in that area that's where the fuel injected bikes t had a better advantage for sure so Yep, unfortunately, I uh, did not do good in Austin, and that was the end of the run. But hell, thirteen years and step up for um, you know just uh, coming in, not even thinking you'd ever ride X Games, is uh, pretty awesome to me. So I definitely had some fun. I don't miss step up, but I miss uh, I miss being in those heated battles. Uh, I'm a competitor, and that's one thing that I heavily do miss is just having the Staples Center roaring. And you know, I mean. If you're on a basketball team like Kobe Bryant, you got the whole team to stare at. But you know, when it's only you on the bike and the whole stable center staring at you, it's it's pretty heavy. And I just miss the whole vibe of how fun X Games was and all that stuff. So um, it's all good though. At least I got to experience it and had a good time. So you weren't just there for step up. You rode freestyle. Uh, you've done best trick. You got an eleventh there. Um, I didn't even think they had more than six or eight riders at X Games anymore. Um, and you also did pretty damn well at speed and style. Yeah, it was fun to get into that. Um, I qualified for the freestyle in 2003 also. So I was able to ride, uh, you know, I think it was step up on Friday. Um, maybe it was, maybe step up was Thursday. Freestyle was Friday. So that was awesome rolling into the LA Coliseum where there's like 60,000 fans and that's where Deegan yeah. did that 360 and, you know, just the high of being on, uh, you know, getting my first gold. And then, um, yeah, like Cliff Campbell, uh, Mason's mechanic, he was my mechanic at the time and he, he tuned in my bike for step up and had that thing ripping. And, uh, then he transferred it over, changed a few things and got it ready for freestyle. And then, uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, that was just like an all time high. Like I, I can, I probably had the biggest smile I've ever had in my life rolling in right there at the LA Coliseum and just, it was sick. Just a little step down and then the double, double, it was like the sickest feeling right there. Just the lights going off, rolling in, man, that was like awesome. So such a big stadium. That would have been huge. It was legit. And, uh, yeah, I, uh, didn't qualify for big air and I, uh had my own big air contest at the bar later that night <laughs> me and my buddy <laughs> and uh we ended up like scaling the 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 hotel the x games hotel building on the the zig you know like on the outside of a building they'll have like the zigzag ladders up the old old school buildings a uh, figaro is like a classic hotel downtown la next to the staples center and so yeah we were you know i was done for the week and so i went out and had some fun you know what i mean and uh <laughs> Uh, the next morning I get a call from X games and they're like, yeah, half the field is eight shit. Uh, we're going to need you to ride. And I'm like, well, I'm 
still a little uh, fuzzy, I would say. And they're like, you just got to jump the ramp twice. I'm like, I got that shit. And so uh, I went in there. And, uh, so that's how I got into big air. Um, everybody uh, running out of talent, taking, eating, eating the ground. Uh, so, yeah, I ended up doing just a little whip, no hander and a stripper and made a thousand bucks. So that was a nice cap on the weekend. So I had a lot of fun. Might have had one eye open when I went off the ramp, but it was okay. I made it. Well, well it's actually quite funny. Um, before we leave the X Games talk, how did you even get into Step Up? Like, it started out as a bit of a joke, right? Yeah, I mean, it was... Uh, yeah, I mean, Mason and I were uh, messing around when X Games came around, and then they were doing Step Up, and Tommy Clowers was... Um, the champ you know and uh mason and i would be messing around in a sand pit up in nevada and we'd hit it just like a steep dirt pile and be trying to be act like tommy clowers like we're clearing the bar so mason and i were used to just mess around and play around with it you know what i mean so <laughs> it's uh it's kind of funny that that's uh how it turned into and i never did step up after that you know and then until i went on the tour with burnett you know a few years later and then next thing i was in x games with it so Kind of just did it because I was broke and needed needed to make some money, but uh, <laughs> it found out all right. Well, it turned out absolutely perfectly for you, so well done for that. Um, now, one thing I was actually thinking of, and I do know, I guess, half of the story, but tell us about this big old scar on your face. Oh yeah, that beauty. Um, uh, that that's <laughs> stupid. That's uh, that that one ruffles my feathers. But you know, uh, shit happens. They didn't make that bumper sticker for no reason. <laughs> yeah, so, that's it. Yeah, we were doing a show down in Alabama, and uh, we we had practiced, and uh, Bartram had just brought, bought this uh, ratchet ass ramp from uh, this guy in Florida, and. Um, it had an AstroTurf, like the, where you would land on the center of the landing. Um, it was all AstroTurf and Anthony Murray and I, we had practiced and it all bunched up, all the AstroTurf had slid down and bunched up at the bottom. So where you would normally jump the ramp where the airbag would go, it was, a you know, like a eight foot tall door by say six foot wide, like kind of a bay door that was like had a, on a winch cable from the top and, you know, like, it would go down and that's how you could like load stuff in it. And then, you know, on the winch cable, it'd go back up. And so after, you know, I was like, well, let's open the door up and slide like four feet of that turf in. Cause it was like way too much turf at the bottom. So, um, you know, we did that and they were starting to slide it in. And then, uh, the guy was starting to do the winch back in and I was down under where the, uh, blower attaches to the airbag. I was taking the tie down off it, unhooking that. And I was like down on my knees and out of the right corner of my eye, I saw that like door, like I heard like a snap and the door kind of release. And I, you know, just out of my peripheral on my right, I, I pushed off with my left foot as hard as I could. And it was too late. The door just bitch slapped me on top of my head and smacked my face down into the uh, blower. But I think if I didn't have that momentum pushing off from my left foot, it would have just smashed me directly down. And, you know, who knows what could have happened there. But, uh, so yeah, I mean, yeah. how hard those, how, how hard that plastic is on those blowers. So my chin ate that one. And then it, it like squirted me out. It didn't even put me on the ground. Like I still was able to stand up and I didn't get knocked out by the door somehow. Um, wow. I mean, I took a hit to the top of the head and the chin and didn't get knocked out. So I don't know what happened. <laughs> so I, I, I got lucky there, but not getting, uh, killed right there and um yeah i mean i could just like feel something was going on i kind of like could look down and i saw like my my chin hanging off and so i ripped my t-shirt off and put it on my face went over to one of the rodeo trucks in the mirror and looked in my mirror pulled my shirt down and my face was just seared open and i was like oh, yeah. i'm like whose truck is this i'll buy you new floor mats so let's go because the, the hospital's like you know it was like an hour away so they, they ran me over to the local fire station, got me in an ambulance, and were getting me all hooked up. But at that point, my throat was swelling up. So then I was, like, starting to almost panic. But I know from when you get hurt, you can't panic. You got to, like, stay calm or, or else it makes it worse. So, yeah, I kept my heart rate down. And uh, then I, I couldn't talk anymore because my throat was swelling up so bad. But then it kind of, like, flattened out. And But, yeah, I couldn't talk. Like, I literally could not talk. And... um 
so then I was like starting to having to write on paper and stuff. I was like, well, get me to the hospital, you know? And, but <laughs> we had gone out to lunch after practice and I had a piece of a uh, little Mexican candy, a little piece of grape candy in there in my mouth. And the whole time I forgot that that candy was in my mouth because the restaurant was yeah, right. Before right we were riding or before we fixed it. Yeah. So we rode practice, we ate lunch. And then, you know, as we were checking out, you know, I had a, a little great piece of candy and we were rolling up the ramps and I literally that whole time, somehow I had the piece of candy in my mouth still. And then I realized it there at, when I was in the ambulance and I like spit it out at Anthony and uh, one of the rodeo guys and they thought it was teeth. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> other reactions, dude. They jumped like no other. It was great. <laughs> wow, yeah. So that kind of made me laugh and lighten the mood on things. Um, so yeah, went to the, went to the hospital and they're like, Oh yeah, it looks like we just need like a, hour hour and a half to sew your face up and i was like cool let's do it and this was like on a friday at like two o'clock well i almost uh died in surgery so they had to put the breathing tube down my throat and they uh kind of put me in like a light coma or whatever and woke me up on saturday evening but i thought it was friday right you know so yeah friday you woke up saturday night yeah and so i mean Apparently, I almost died in surgery. The doctor said so. They, you know, they had to do the breathing tube. Um, so yeah, kind of crazy. Almost <laughs> died on the get my face crushed, and then uh, you know, in surgery. So that that was kind of heavy. And then so by the time I comprehended that it was Sunday, you know, or what day it was, it was on Sunday. So yeah, the dad and the wife flew in, and uh, yep, yeah, had to uh, nurse my face back along and. Uh, I had a show in two weeks in Northern California coming up. So I had to go back and I had to move out of my rental house into um, put my stuff in storage. And then I went and rode a show two weeks later because I was sitting there thinking, I was like, you don't need your face to ride. So then I was like, I'm going to go, I'm going to go photo and see if I can ride my, I was like a pissed off chipmunk, man. My face was so swollen and it hurt so, hurt so bad to put the helmet on. <laughs> so I went and, uh, uh, I went and motoed at Paula and I was like, oh, fuck, I can ride. So then I, uh, I didn't practice freestyle at all. And I just let this, I just iced up as much as I could. And then I, I grabbed the mobile ramps and drove up to Northern California and, uh, went and rode a rodeo up there with Bartram and, uh, yeah, it worked out good. You don't need your face. You don't need your jaw to, to jump a dirt bike. Just don't hit it. My, uh, Tom's Tom Cruise smile has gone away. So, uh, maybe if they need, a um, somebody for goonies to look like sloth or something i could it's no different than driving down the road and someone hits you you know or if you're walking down the sidewalk and someone hits you you know i mean it's just life's going to give you what it's going to give you so i mean you can't exactly. it's what it is so i mean it's unfortunately i mean everyone thinks it's from riding but um yeah it's from uh rolling up ramps so you know um now every time there's a cable involved or Anything, I make sure everyone stands way back. If, if I'm there, I, I make a point to tell everyone. I'll be like, look at this. Do you want one of these? Then stand the hell back. <laughs> so Yeah, so you got to be the old guy and tell everybody to just be safe. But uh, being the old guy, with age comes a cage. And you've got into monster trucks. How the hell did that happen? That sounds like it would be so much fun. Um, yeah, so... In 2014, I had uh, we were down practicing at Feld Entertainment in Florida for Nuclear Cowboys, and some of the higher up bosses were there watching. So I pulled one aside and uh, Charlie Mancuso and asked if uh, what it would take to get me in a monster truck because I kind of wanted to go the Damon Bradshaw route and you know kind of get out of the, off the dirt bike and get in the monster trucks. So I thought it'd be a good transfer, and um, so yeah, with age comes a cage. So I thought that would be a good idea. So I thought, why not start working on it and poke at my contacts? Might as well. So yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't hear anything. And that was in like December of 2013. And then April of 14, I get a call to that. I'm going to go test monster truck. I was like, heck yeah. So I tested in 14 and 15. And then I never heard anything. And so I kind of thought it was a wash. And then um, Todd LaDuke went to monster energy and Damon Bradshaw and Monster and Fell didn't come to terms with uh, an agreement. So then Monster Energy wanted Todd LaDuke. So then that moved Todd LaDuke from the Metal Militia truck to uh, the Monster Energy truck. And then that opened the door for me. Hmm. So 
I got called to go do that and I went to Detroit and I didn't even remember how to start the dang truck. <laughs> Where's the keys? <laughs> um, yeah, no. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, they're like, you know, we, they're like, we want, cause they, they'll, they'll video you when you uh, test and stuff. So they're like, yeah, you know, we watch you, you're, you're, you're a good driver. So, um, I just don't hit the wall. So I was like, all right, no worries. So, uh, yeah, no, it was good. And you know, they're very, Feld's very high up on, um, fan safety so they they definitely made that a point to you know that i was well aware of that so um yeah i turned the truck pointed towards the middle and hammer down so that's what i did and uh, it was pretty cool man i got to do six shows and then end up driving the world finals in vegas and even got to flip the truck so that was pretty awesome no way so then what was the setup to do the backflip uh they had a shipping container uh like at like under the big billboard sign at the on the north end of the stadium so yeah they do like a big row of shipping containers and i was doing my run and the truck just kind of spit out and squared up at the shipping containers i was like well looks like we're doing this right now and i've never done it before so i just hammered out and landed it so somehow i stuck the first one and it's uh i did i put my uh finals run on the reel on my x games so you can check it out there so yeah so yeah yeah, go to the Insta, go to my reel, and you can see my freestyle run on there. So, yeah, it was a uh, pretty awesome man. It was a uh, it was another uh, very huge legendary experience. Like it, it gave me that feeling when got to uh, roll into the LA Coliseum, and then uh, those those two stand out huge in my life. To be able to drive the uh, World Finals for Monster Jam and the Metal Militia truck that was rad. Just rolling in there with all those trucks and just all the horsepower and all the fans and just being able to flip the truck and go big. It was, uh, it was just an amazing feeling for sure. Yeah. I've, uh, done f- monster truck shows in Australia, but that's only baby stuff compared to what you've done with Feld there in America. Just, you're just jumping so damn big, but with freestyle in monster trucks, is it kind of like freestyle motocross on the dirt where nobody actually really knows unless you're a true core fan of FMX, what the most tech tricks are, what's the most gnarly, what's going to get you the biggest points. In freestyle in monster trucks, like, do what do you have to do to win this sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, for, yeah, freestyle, it's a lot more uh, thought out and planned where, you know, you're like, okay, I know I can do this trick, this trick feels good off that ramp, you know, and then this one should be followed up by that one. It's a lot more thought out. And I started to do that with my freestyle runs in my monster, in the monster truck. And then I started talking to a couple of the people or a couple of the other drivers and they're like, no, we just planned the first, you know, they would say two or three hits and hope they even get that far. And then they just (laughs) just kind of bounces wherever, turn, point, shoot, don't hit the wall, rotate that truck and get it back towards the center of the stadium and send it back. So, you know, I mean, you kind of learn to kind of just freelance it and uh, it's literally freestyle (laughs) and uh, just kind of let it rip, you know, the truck. You know, I mean, it just depends on what wheel it lands first, on what way it's going to shoot the truck, how hard it lands. And I mean, it, it'll spit out any which way. So you just got to kind of uh, just manage it and wing it. And it's like a mosh pit in there. It's pretty rowdy, no matter how strapped down you are. So your hands are blowing off the wheel and shit. And you're trying to, you know, uh, your hands are flying off. You're trying to grab the wheel and then control those big tires and stuff. It, it gets pretty intense and stuff. Um, those dudes that like Ryan Anderson and, um, couple of those those top drivers man they're really talented after getting re- getting uh getting a chance to drive those things but yeah and to uh as far as like judging wise you know you really want to kind of get some big wow factors in there you know you um you want to like wow the crowd as big as you can obviously you know that people like to see the truck go big or you know if you cartwheel the truck you know get it back on its wheels somehow you know you can turn the rear steer or uh hit the uh you know just hammer the throttle and try to get it to spit back up on its wheels and then you know they like to see the the body flying off and then sending it again and then flip it and you want to do like a good donut and you know do a good wheelie and so you just kind of need to touch a variety on everything and uh you know that's kind of how it's judged in in uh the freestyle of the monster trucks right so then you're just pinning it you're sending it and everything's working out well what happens if something goes wrong because you're in a big monster truck and there's a crowd not too far away from you right yeah it's uh yeah there there's some 
some pucker moments for sure. The, the, a lot of times uh, they'll do a, a shipping container, you know, a couple feet, you know, like a, like three to five feet, like in inland, you know, so you, yeah. so the shipping container, not the wall. So they they protect the stadiums the best they can, you know. And but I mean, it is a monster truck, and you know they're, they're they've seen everything, and you know a truck a wheel can come off. And that thing stops when it wants to stop. So, you know, I mean, who knows which way those things can bounce. But, you know, they got cables on the hubs and got it all, like, you know, strapped down to to avoid that. So they, they got the trucks, like, really good and safe now, you know, pretty much for the most part. But anything can happen still. So how do you feel then when you're doing it? It must feel freaking awesome, right, just to do it. But also, I just wanted to know, like, how's your body feeling? Is your back killing you? Are you in pain doing it? Because you're getting smashed around. There's some big jumps and some big landings. Yeah, I mean, uh, all that kind of depends on. Um, it to really, you got to have like a seat that's made for you. You know, they had like Feld has like a, um, I guess a jig that can kind of like mold the seat to you more. And okay. so they, they get the seat. The seat is the number one thing, and then you got to have the belts. You got to have the right belts. You can't just that see some belts and think you're all good you got to have the right belts for your body so that's also those are two major things and then yeah you know shock setup is definitely big and i mean the best way to come to say it is if you land the truck perfectly flat like if you go big and you land the truck flat it's like ass checking off the seat and when you jump into a um, foam pit on a dirt bike like it does hurt um, so what you, what you want to try to do is just go a little sideways, you know, left or right and, uh, off a lip. You don't want to really ever go perfectly straight. Cause if you get the front to back or back to front bounce, you can smack your head pretty good. No matter how strapped you're in, it's still a lot of, uh, intense energy coming down and, uh, you, you, you'll feel those. So, yeah, I mean, I always tried to, I learned to try to go a little crooked off things, you know, um, yeah. that's the, kind of some of the vet drivers taught me, but yeah, I mean, it, it can hurt you. Um, I've noticed more like my head would kind of feel a little funny. Like you, you had a concussion, you know, like almost like you were high after every show. I never got knocked out, but there's guys that have jumped and got knocked out before. Um, no way. But yeah, there was a couple of times I'd be like blinking, like fighting to not be knocked out. So more or less, that was the best, like hardest thing for me. I mean, even in the world finals, I had three strips of duct tape on my forehead of my helmet and then wrapped over the back of the seat and uh, you know, I was so strapped you, in. I to like hold my, yourself in. Yeah, to hold my head back. So, because I knew I was going to go big, bigger than I had, because I kind of got the green light to go bigger. And uh, yeah, I had the, you know, my, the the belts were tightened down so bad, like it felt like my pelvis was going to snap. I could barely breathe and still was like hitting my head pretty good. So it's, it's, uh, it's definitely, they're, they're rowdy for sure. Um, you know, I didn't really notice too much of my back, just as long as I didn't land the truck flat. Um, cause that'll like ass check you pretty good. But, you know, I mean, it would, uh, have to depend on how good, uh, his belts were and everything in the seat, if it really fit him. But, and yeah, and, and then shock setup is huge, you know, how the truck bottoms out. All right. So you're given the freedom to do what you want, send it. When you break parts, and I'm guessing there's some big parts yeah. to break there. Who's paying for that? Is that coming out of your back pocket? Uh, nope, no, nope. that was all on felt tab, and uh, I never heard anything. Um, I never heard a peep. I mean, if you're so, if you're driving the truck like an a hole, like a superhero, and then uh, then then you'll get kind of told something. But no, they they want to put on a good show, and they they know that stuff is going to get destroyed in parts, and they know it's mechanical. They're on a full understanding. So, um, yeah, I mean, in the seven shows that I did, I mean, um. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd do some damage, but even my crew chief was like, cause I'd feel, but you feel bad, you know, I'm like, oh shit, <laughs> you know, but they're like, no, this is nothing. This is normal. And I'm like, all right. And then the next show, oh man, I'd feel bad. And they're like, no, nope, you're good. And I'm like, all right. El Paso, I destroyed the truck pretty good. I needed a new rear end and, uh, some welding on the chassis and, uh, ripped a body off and messed up some stuff, but still didn't hear nothing. They had the truck ready for Vegas and I sent it there. And so, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, they, they understand they want the value of the show. So they know the truck needs to get roughed up for sure. So, um, you know, Monster Jam's definitely on that and trying to put on a good show for the crowd, you know. So you've had some of the best times 
in your life, some huge points in your career. With age comes the cage, but you're still riding freestyle motocross. Have you thought about the big R word, retirement? Yeah, as far as retiring, um, I've been trying to do that for three years now. It's not working so good. Um, so what I guess I've learned that, uh, man, I just really love it um, more than I thought. And, you know, I mean, I had a lot of heart to get into where where I made it. And, uh, you know, a lot of heart and passion. And, um, man, it's uh, like trying to stop a train. It ain't that easy. Um, I just love to travel. I just love to experience. And, you know, I, I, it's not going too well with me. I don't, I don't want it to end. You know, uh, I have so much fun just meeting new people and, you know, it's just like, I don't know. I just stand there and take it all in. You know, that's what I've, I've kind of done the last five years is just make sure I'm enjoying the experience a lot more. And, you know, I don't even really, I don't really call too many sponsors anymore. I touch base with a couple, but, uh, I'm pretty much just doing it for myself. You know what I mean? I just, I love it. It, it's definitely know there's a high risk and I probably should quit, but I'm going to be hurting when I'm older anyway. So fuck it. But yeah, you know, it is closer. Um, retirement's closer than, uh, than it's not. Um, I'm actually think I might have a good job lined up and I'm going to, I'm going to ride this year. Um, and just kind of see what it does. I'm not putting no pressure on there. It ends what it ends. And, uh, but I also know I need to meet it, meet it in the middle. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, just trying to really aggressively work on some other things because I didn't set myself up that good. So any of you young bucks out there listening, uh, make sure you set yourself up a little better because uh, now I'm gonna having to deal with it, you know, which is, uh, you know, I wish I would have did it earlier. But yeah, I mean, uh, I think I, you know, if I can get this uh, new job going, um, it might be it at the end of the year. I don't know. And then Todd Potter had a good, uh, some good advice that, you know, he's like, you know, I just, I just run heavy equipment. And then if I feel like riding a show and a good show comes up and then I just go ride it, you know, if I don't feel like riding it, then I don't ride it. So I kind of got that attitude. Potter took a lot of uh, stress off of it. So I'm just going to, uh, you know, if an opportunity comes up and I'm feeling good on the bike, then why not? You know what I mean? Uh, definitely got my tricks toned down to where I feel safe. And, uh, but you know, I can still put on a good show and have fun just trying to meet it all in the middle and be a 40 year old vet freestyle rider, I suppose. <laughs> so then do you still have the same competitive spirit that you had 10 years ago? Yeah. As far as the competitive edge, um, I don't think that ever goes away. I, I still feel like hints of it. And then I have to realize that I am four years old and I'll probably kill myself. So let's not do that. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, try to meet it in the middle and, uh, you know, sometimes I'll, if the, if the setup's right and stuff, you know, like, um, I never do no handed flips and I was doing a couple no handed flips at this one show in Montana just cause the ramp and everything was feeling good. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, some days you just feel you're feeling it on the bike and then some days you just got to survive through shows. I mean, there's times where I'm sitting there, you know, before I go out and where it's like kind of sketchy. I'm like, why am I still doing this? But <laughs> then, then I just start riding and it all goes away and I just snap into my mode and can get her done. But, um, yeah, it's kind of, uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, is what it is. I'm just, I enjoy it. You know, I just enjoy the the fans and just having fun, the travel. And um, so I'm just trying to, to do it for myself and enjoy the last few years of my freestyle career and uh, just try to get, get set up. I want to get invested in some real estate and hopefully get this other job going and, and keep the ball rolling and, you know, just uh, just ride when I can. Man, that's crazy. What, what kind of work are you looking to get into? It's a water treatment plant. So, like, if you come to or like a machine shop they'll use like waters and like oils and they'll mix together so then a truck will come and get those from that machine shop and then bring it to the water treatment plant we'll separate the waters and oils you know or whatever chemicals are in the waters so to try to separate those and they'll, they'll go to separate tanks and then recycle them so um just kind of uh doing that maybe you can call me a button pusher but um <laughs> it's uh it'll be all right uh, i think the pay is supposed to be pretty good so it has my interest and yeah if i can and he's cool with me he rides motocross so the owner so if he's cool with me going to ride a few shows still so i think it kind of meets it perfectly in the middle to where i can kind of break free and and still have my freedom of going to jump and and work a regular job too and maybe start getting into some real estate and then uh so yeah it's kind of my new game plan we'll see if it works or not so then have you still got a riding spot to keep yourself not from getting too rusty 
Yeah, I do have a little practice spot. Crystal's my wife's uh, mom. She lives four miles away, so I got three ramps set up there. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I can go uh, dust uh, dust off the cobwebs and, and uh, get the bike upside down and run through the tricks. It's always good to do and uh, be able to do that and then getting a 110 track going in the backyard. So we uh lots of motocross tracks around so I can uh, keep up on the bike confidence all around and have some fun riding. So we're in a brand new neighborhood and I got in with the dirt guys and they've been uh, bringing me all the, uh, all the excess, uh, good dirt and into the backyard <laughs> there. So getting free dirt. And, uh, once, uh, once they bring me all the dirt, I'm going to rent a skatey and, and whip up me a 110 track. My 110 should be here in a couple of weeks. So, um, yeah, hopefully get that going and have some friends over. I'm going to put a golf green in the back. So can, uh, have a par three hole on the, on the, on the property so we can golf, we can ride, we can barbecue. We could have fun. Yeah, I was always thinking, like, what would I do when I'm retired? And I was thinking, you know, I want to keep being a professional sports person, living the dream. And I thought, professional golfer. They're making good cash. You don't have to be physically fit, because I'm not. Uh, If John Daly can get around the way he does, I was like, yeah, I can do that. Getting a golf buggy and, uh, yeah, would be awesome. Have you thought about it? Yeah, no, you're right there. You pinpointed that. I'd love to golf. Uh, if I could get on the on the senior tour, that'd be awesome. Uh, but I'm definitely not that good uh, at golf. Mason's Mason and Foster are damn good at golf right now. Those guys have been on. So, yeah, I've been uh, I've been playing every week, and we're we're three months deep and going every weekend with uh, um, some buddies here in Texas. We're playing tomorrow, and uh, but yeah, I definitely got a long ways to go to get to that point. But yeah, that would be awesome. I wish I could. Well, I don't want to hold you up too much. I guess you've got a big day building 110 tracks, golf courses in the backyard. Thanks so much for jumping in and having a call with us. All right, man. Yeah, sounds good. I better get to stretching so I can uh, be good for golf tomorrow. Good to chat with you, man. And thanks for having me. I really hope you enjoyed that episode. And again, I have to apologize for some of the audio parts within this episode, but I think I worked enough magic that it was salvageable. I want to thank each and every one of you for listening, tuning in either just to this episode, if it was your first time, or if you've been here for every other episode as well. Did Matt Byton just make you a bigger fan of him too? What what did you think? Let me know. Hopefully he won't be hanging his boots up before you've seen him at another show in the near future, or maybe you'll be catching up with Matt Biden at a monster truck show. That would be pretty freaking cool as well. I want to thank the great people at Rothouse Brewery for creating the best cure for dry January that I've ever seen. The alcohol-free version of their Tannen Zepfler beers taste exactly the same as the real deal, but I'm able to not feel guilty as I'm trying to get over a big holiday season of eating way too much But that's what happens at this time of year, right? Actually, to be honest, I don't feel guilty at all. I just like drinking the alcohol-free version of the Tannen Zepfler beers. So check uh, check the link in the show description on how you can get a box of the Tannen Zepfler alcohol-free beers as well. And you can also try out Dry January with that. Also, don't forget, if you want to grab some free Spect eyewear sunglasses, check out the all-new Riders Lounge podcast website. It's simple, www.writersloungepodcast.com. It was created by Lakes Networking. And just check out the first blog entry and you'll see how you can win these sunglasses. Thanks to Spect for their goggles. They're so freaking comfortable while I'm getting roosted on the track and the sunglasses stop the flies from getting in my eyes while I'm hanging my head out the window and sweating my ass on the way home. Thank you again for tuning in. If you haven't already, follow or subscribe the pod to the podcast and you'll be notified when the next episode comes out, which hopefully won't be sabotaged by a faulty USB port.